بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so inshallah we will resume from where uh, we left off last halqa and uh, we had finished the battle of Hunain and Taif and the benefits of the battle of Hunain and the siege of Taif and today inshallah ta'ala we will move on to the Ghazwati Tabuk uh, but before we do that just a very quick note uh, that there were around six months before between the, the siege of Taif and the battle of Tabuk what happened in these six months around seven or eight mini expeditions which we're not going to go into the names of the uh, small expeditions the Prophet did not participate but he sent the Sahaba to neighboring uh, tribes and neighboring lands and one of the main purposes was to destroy large idols to destroy public idols and also to bring in uh, the small tribes around Mecca around Medina that were still remaining uh, to bring in so there's no need to go into all of the names but for example just so that you know the more famous ones Tufayl ibn Amr was sent to destroy the idol of Dhil Kafain and Ali ibn Abi Talib was sent to destroy the idol of al Tay by the name of Al-Fuls and other idols were destroyed as well now it's a very important point, especially in light of modern political uh, issues where we have these groups that are destroying uh, uh, basically uh, sacred sites or whatnot, and they use these incidents from the Sira as evidence to destroy modern sites. Now, uh, one thing needs to be uh, reiterated, and that is that the Prophet only did this after he had established his political authority in the land. In other words, He's not destroying Dhil Kafain, he's not destroying Al Fuls, he's not destroying uh, Al Uzza and other of these idols until he has established political authority, right? So this is after the conquest of Mecca, after the Battle of Hunayn, when Central Arabia is basically his completely. And he's now expanding and conquering all of Arabia. So when the political power is with the Islamic State, at this point in time, they might contemplate uh, destroying uh, the idols of uh, the, the pagan idols, but there's another issue here now, right? There's another issue, and that issue is what do our scholars say, what do the madhahib say about the freedom of other religions to worship in an Islamic state, right? This is another issue that many people bring up. And the fact of the matter is that there has been a controversy from the very beginning of Islam uh, amongst uh, the tabi'un and tabat tabi'un. By unanimous consensus, Jews and Christians, of course, uh, are allowed to practice their faith in the Islamic uh, state. This is something well known, and the Quran is explicit on this, and uh, hadith are, are mentioned about this point. Uh, there's no ikhtilaf at all. The question comes, how about paganistic religions? How about religions that are not Ahli Kitab religions? This is the, uh, the question and the response is that we've had ikhtilaf from the very beginning of time. Uh, by almost unanimous consensus, there is, uh, there is no idolatry allowed in the Arabian Peninsula, fi Jazirat al-Arab. And this was perhaps the greatest success of our Prophet Sallallahu is that he permanently got rid of idolatry amongst the Arabs, amongst Jazirat al-Arab and the ethnicity of the Arabs, right? So to this day, you really don't have idolaters amongst the Arabs. And this is something that is the success of Islam, that it completely wiped it out. How about worshipping idols outside of the Arabian Peninsula? Would an Islamic state tolerate that? And the four madhahib have differed on this issue. The four madhahib have differed on this issue. Some of the madhahib said, you can only uh, take as citizens uh, in Ahl al-Dhimma status, Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians. Zoroastrians, of course, are the uh, uh, Parsis we call them in India, Pakistan, the ones that uh, consider fire to be a source of divinity and whatnot. And the reason that Zoroastrians are included but in all of the madhahib is that Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, when they conquered uh, Persia, when they conquered Persia, Iran, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab said, treat them like you treat Jews and Christians. Treat them like you treat Jews and Christians. And so they were treated like Jews and Christians in terms of giving the jizya and being allowed to practice their faith within their, their temples. Now, from this, some of the scholars have said only Zoroastrians have an exception uh, from Jews and Christians. Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, no other group. However, two points. Firstly, there's always been an opposing view and the most famous madhab that championed it very strenuously was the Hanafi madhab. The Hanafi madhab said, you may qiyas on all of the religions. Why do we stop only at Zoroastrians? Because Zoroastrians do not believe in our God. Jews and Christians, do they believe in our God? 
Yes, what's your evidence? The Qur'an is explicit. Anybody who denies this, and there are many ignorant Muslims who deny this, right? And I have met plenty of them. Anybody who denies this has not even read the Qur'an. Allah says in the Qur'an, talking about the Ahli Kitab, wa ilahuna wa ilahukum wahid. We have the same God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Ishmael, the God of Moses, the God, of, this is the same God, the God of Noah, that's the same God. Now, Zoroastrians, do they have this God, our God? No. They don't have our God. They have uh, 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 Ahura Mazda and Ahriman, the God of good and the God of, of evil, the God of light and the God of darkness, right? Ahura Mazda is the God of good and Ahriman is the God of evil. They have two ultimate divinities. They don't believe in Abraham and Moses and they don't believe in any of this. Yet, by unanimous consensus, all of the Madahib said that the Zoroastrians are treated like Ahli Kitab. Now, based on this, the Hanafi Madhab and also some riwayat in the Maliki and Hanbali Madhab, they said that therefore all non-Arab paganistic religions have the same exception. They didn't allow the exception for the Arabs. Why? Because, meaning, when I say Arabs here, I mean the Arabian Peninsula. And in those days, it was basically the same. You didn't have Arabs in Egypt at the time of the Prophet You didn't have Arabs. So by Arabs, we mean Jazirat al-Arab. Why? Because Jazirat al-Arab has a sacred, not a sacred, but a, 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 I mean, a better status or a holier status. Even sacred is not a bad word to use in English. It has a status that the other lands do not have. And our Prophet ﷺ said on his deathbed, أَخْرِجُ الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ مِنْ جَزِيرَةِ الْعَرَبِ Meaning in the Arabian Peninsula, you cannot have two religions flourishing. You can have another religion that is on the side, but not apparent, not public. So you can have other religions in small communities, but not flourishing. This is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. But he never said that you have to expel them from non Jazirat al-Arab. Jazirat al-Arab is the Arabian Peninsula. So, based on this, the other opinion, and the opinion that pretty much everybody has acted upon in the history of Islam, and this is a very important point that most people who want to just study a book, they don't ignore, they ignore history. Historically speaking, what did our Khulafa do? The Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Ottomans, what did they do? All of the Khulafa, by and large, they, to they tolerated every minority, as long as that minority was civil. What do I mean by civil? They didn't go murdering. They didn't go on a rampage. They didn't go killing other people. And that is why we have the most bizarre ideologies and religions to this day in places in the Muslim world, right? We have the most bizarre. I already spoke about, uh, I mean, uh, religions and ideologies that we don't even believe are Islamic. For example, the Druze and the Alawis were very small groups. We don't view them as being Muslims because they don't believe in, in the Kalima and, and they don't pray, they don't fast. And the Alawis, as we know, were a small minority until the French came. We, we talk, I talked about this in the 1914 lecture, you remember. The Alawis were a small minority and they were only attacked by the Khulafa when the Alawis themselves became violent. Otherwise, they lived to their own and they were given their, basically, uh, uh, just hands off, like don't ask, don't tell type of policy. Don't attack us, we won't attack you. And right now, we're looking at what's happening with the Yazidis of uh, Iraq, right? And the Yazidis are one of the most bizarre cults that emanated from within our religion, but then they broke away completely. They have nothing to do with Islam anymore. They don't even consider themselves Muslims, even though their Sheikh Adi ibn Musfir uh, was a righteous Sufi Sheikh, but when he died, they continue to just exaggerate and change, and, and they have some bizarre ideology. Believe it or not, they actually believe uh, that uh, Shaitan uh, is... Um, he repented from his sin and he is now worthy of being an intercessor between them and Allah or God. And so they worship Shaitan al taq They call him the golden, the, the golden, the golden peacock. They call him a tawud, they call him the golden peacock. And so they have this misnomer that they are Satan worshippers. There's an element of truth and there's an element of exaggeration. They don't view Shaitan as being Shaitan. But they worship Shaitan in some bizarre way. Like you, right? So Anyway, we're going to my tangent. You don't want to know about... Well, maybe you don't want to know about Yazidis, but not, the topic now is not Yazidis, right? The, the, no way we have... Uh, this is new. This is news to me. Wow. 
Well then bring them, we want to speak to them. If they converted to Islam, bring them, we want to speak to them and find out. Because I have never met in my life uh, a person of this uh, belief. My point being, the Yazidis have existed. Uh, this Adi ibn Musfir, he died around 532 or something Hijrah. Right? So that's around a thousand years ago. And it took like a hundred years for them to develop and, and evolve. This is in the heartland of the Abbasid Caliphate. This is in the heartland of the Abbasid Caliphate. And they were allowed to just be alone and do what they're doing. What does this demonstrate? Historically speaking, I mean, look at the Mughal dynasty, right? If the Mughal dynasty had attempted to follow the strict Shafi'i position, they would have immediately ceased to exist. The majority of the inhabitants were what? Hindu, Hindu right? And they allowed them to be as they are. And, uh, and this is the standard Hanafi position. So the point being that, and I say this because these incidents of the process of destroying idols and whatnot, it is now being used in our times uh, by these groups, firstly to uh, destroy some, sometimes things that are not idols. And now technically speaking, I want to be very blunt here, in an ideal Islamic state, you could not practice shirk publicly. So. If you were of another religion, you will worship in the way you want to worship in your place of worship. And these idols that were destroyed were public idols. So there's a difference between a public icon of shirk, you have a public idol, right? Versus the temples that are closed and only the people of that religion come into that temple. Historically speaking, this is how it was it had existed in Muslim lands. That the people of other religions, they had their places of worship. The Zoroastrians, from our perspective, they worship fire. Now I say this, Zoroastrians don't agree with what I said. They don't say, they would say we're not worshiping fire. And from their perspective, they don't consider it worship. From our perspective, when you present offerings and you bow down and you consider fire to be holy and whatnot, we call this ibadah. From our perspective, they are worshipping. From their perspective, they say they don't worship. My point being, the Islamic State allowed them to worship other than Allah in their lands, but within their temples. They were not allowed to be go public in this regard. So here we have uh, an extremism that we see in our times of these groups that they want to destroy anybody that doesn't agree with them. And in our religion, uh, firstly, if you want to do this properly, you need to have authority in the land. You need to have statehood. Our Prophet ﷺ didn't begin his da'wah by destroying the, Kaaba, the, the idols around the Kaaba, did he? Did he begin his da'wah by destroying the idols around the Kaaba? No. When did he destroy the idols? When he conquered Mecca. After 20 years of preaching. And these guys, they want to start from this exact point when nobody will accept this from them. And then number two, they selectively apply. They don't know properly which thing to go and destroy. Our Prophet ﷺ allowed and the Sharia allows the freedom of worship of other religions if it is done in in their own places of worship. And this is the standard position, the majority position, and also historically, this is how the Ummah has always done it. I do not know of any case, now maybe there could be some obscure case, somebody will correct me you know, next week. I do not know of any famous or well-known case of an Islamic caliphate destroying an entire ethnicity, an entire population, an entire religion, just because they disagreed with that religion. I don't know of any Abbasid, Umayyad, uh, Ottoman, Seljuq, I've never heard of this in my study of history. Now again, maybe there's one instance that proves the rule, but the general rule is what? The Ummah tolerated the beliefs of other religions as long as some conditions were met, and of those conditions is, and this is a common sense condition, don't practice your shirk out in public. Don't have an idol in the town square and sacrifice to the idol in the town square. If you want to do something that goes against uh, the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal, that's something in your own in your own uh, religion basically, then you do it within your own community, not in front of others. And I say this again because these types of incidents are misused and abused by the modern groups in our times. And this is not, in my opinion, a correct understanding of the Sharia. Now, we move on now to the Battle of Tabuk. The Battle of Tabuk. And we'll spend, inshallah, a few weeks on the Battle of uh, Tabuk. Uh, what, are, what are the names of this battle? Why did it take place? When did it take place? That's what we're going to talk about, inshallah, ta today. The names of this battle, two primary names. Two primary names of this battle. Both of them are mentioned in the Hadith. One of them is referenced in the Quran, but not by the name of the battle, but rather as an incident. As for the most prominent name, it is Ghazwatu Tabuk. Ghazwati Tabuk. The expedition of Tabuk. Why? Because 
as our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself said, uh, as Mu'adh ibn Jabal reports that Mu'adh said that we went on the expedition uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the year of Ghazwat Tabuk. And we were combining our prayers, Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha, until we came close. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, tomorrow you shall arrive at the well or the spring of Tabuk, Aini Tabuk. So he used the phrase Aini Tabuk. He called a place of land, uh, a, a small body of water, Aini Tabuk, and Ain means a spring. It's not a well. That's a mis 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 uh, incorrect translation. Ain is a small spring. So tomorrow you're going to arrive at the spring of Tabuk, and you shall arrive there at the hot time of the day. So make sure you do not touch its water until I get there. And we'll dis d discuss why the Sahaba had run out of water. They were extremely thirsty. They thought they were going to die, and that they were going to come to Tabuk the next day. And the Prophet said, make sure you do not touch the water until you get there. So so Mu'ad said that when we arrived, we saw a small slither of water, like the strap of a sandal, just a small amount of water rather than the big Ain. There was, it had dried up, it was the heat of the summer, and there's a small bit left. And we saw two men from our camp already having preceded us. So the Prophet asked them, have you touched its water? And they said, yes. So the Prophet became angry at them and he said what Allah wanted him to say. This is Mu'ad's hadith. He said what Allah wanted him to say. So Mu'ad did not quote what the Prophet said. Why? Adab. You just cover up. The Prophet was irritated. He deserved to be irritated. He was angry at these two men for having disobeyed. And he said some harsh phrases and Mu'ad did not want to report these harsh phrases out of adab. Uh, we are not gossip mongers. We are not tattletalers. What happened, happened. And you, you should know that the Prophet ﷺ rebuked them. But you don't need to know the words that he used. So Mu'ad said, he said what Allah wanted him to uh, say. Then he commanded us to gather as much as we could of the water in one place. So whatever is the water, to gather it in one place. Then he washed his, fat, his hands and face in that water. And then the water began to gush out to spring forth until all of us drank from that water. And uh, there were probably 20,000 people or so. So from this small slither, all of the army drank uh, at the Aini Tabuk. And so because of this incident that the army was quite literally saved at Tabuk, they were about to die out of uh, thirst. So they were saved at the Aini Tabuk. So the expedition became called the expedition of Tabuk. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Our Prophet ﷺ said, O Mu'adh, it's only a matter of time. If you live long enough, this very land you will see will be a land of greenery and gardens. So he said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal that this land of Tabuk or this place of Tabuk uh, will become a land of greenery. And uh, subhanAllah, when the Prophet ﷺ said this, Tabuk was in the middle of the desert. In fact, it was not a well-known place. It was just a small oasis. Nobody lived there. You didn't have a civilization or a city around there. And today, Tabuk, simply because our Prophet ﷺ camped there and Allah had willed it and he predicted it, uh, the Prophet ﷺ predicted it, Tabuk is now one of the largest cities in uh, Arabia. It is in fact the largest city in northern Arabia. It's a stone's throw away from Jordan. And uh, yes, Tabuk used to be on the trading route between Sham and Medina, between Sham and Yemen, but nobody really lived in Tabuk. It was not a city or a town, but after the, uh, the Prophet's time and early Islam, people began to congregate over there. Over time, uh, it became more and more prestigious. In 1655 CE, around 400 years ago, the Ottomans built a famous fortress, remnants of which still stand to this day. Uh, and then eventually when the Ottomans built uh, the famous railroad, and I talked about the railroad as well in my class, 1914, I talked about the famous railroad uh, from Istanbul to from Istanbul to Medina, from Istanbul to Medina, and of course, by the way, from Istanbul it was connected to Europe, so you could quite literally travel by rail in the 1800s and early 1900s anywhere in Europe to Medina. So um, when the Ottomans connected uh, Istanbul uh, to Damascus to Medina, so they made Tabuk one of the main stopping points. 
and therefore this increased the city of Tabuk or the, the, the dwelling of Tabuk until now subhanAllah Tabuk is one of the largest cities in Arabia it has a population of uh, more than half a million people and it is indeed a land of greenery and trees exactly as the Prophet predicted one of those amazing predictions that hadith is in Sahih Muslim and he told Mu'adh ibn Jabal that this land of Tabuk it's only a matter of time before it will be a land of greenery a land of jinan lots of jannat and subhanallah Tabuk these days is a resort it's a very beautiful uh, city um, has anybody been to Tabuk uh, have you been to Tabuk uncle or not no I've never had the opportunity to go up to Tabuk uh, but it is uh, I have been told that the very oasis that allegedly the process them drank from it is still green and oasis right there and it is still water in that place I don't know I haven't been there I have been told and I've been told that also there's a masjid uh, there that uh, uh, is called Masjid Rasulullah he didn't build it but later people built it to basically demonstrate or commemorate the place that he was Allah knows best but uh, this is what I have been told about the the place of uh, Tabuk um, so this is the first name of the expedition Ghazwa to Tabuk Ghazwa to Tabuk the second name of the expedition is Jaysh al-Usra the army of great difficulty Jaysh al-Usra the army of great difficulty and this is in fact the more common name amongst the Sahaba the Sahaba referred to this as the Jaysh al-Usra as the army of great difficulty and Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih al-Bukhari he in fact when he talks about the chapter the book of Sirah he actually has the book of Sirah then he has all of the chapters Bab of the Badr Bab of Uhud when he gets to the book he says Ghazwati Tabuk and it is the Usra so he has both names in the chapter heading it is the chapter of uh, it is the expedition of Usra why was it called difficult why was it called the difficult expedition? Wasn't every battle of the Prophet ﷺ difficult? Yes, indeed. But the battle of Tabuk was difficult in ways that none of the other battles were. And the battle of Tabuk is significant. I'll just jump the gun and tell you, and most of you know this, there was no actual battle in Tabuk. There was no actual clash of swords and, 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 and armies meeting armies. That didn't happen. Yet the difficulties of Tabuk in some ways were much more difficult than any other quote unquote battle and so it was called the difficult Ghazwa even though there was no actual bloodshed the armies did not meet but what happened was so difficult the Sahaba almost died maybe multiple times according to the, the narrations why? well number of reasons first and foremost this was to be the largest army that Arabia had ever seen up until that point in its entire history now every time the battles are happening, we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And Ghazwa to Hunayn, how many people? Remind me, Hunayn. Between 10 to 12,000, right? Between 10 to 12,000. Ghazwa to Tabuk, it is estimated, and the books mention figures that probably are larger than they, they can be. Some say up to 20, even 30,000 are mentioned. The point being, this was the largest. Now, we need to be a little bit careful here. These numbers, it's human nature, nothing wrong with it to kind of sort of exaggerate. So if in our Eid gatherings, for example, if a person estimates how many people come for Eid, yani we have a 10,000, mashallah. See, like, Iqbal Akal definitely wants to make it, mashallah, 10,000. It's human nature. You see a large gathering and you kind of sort of, you know, inflate the numbers a little bit, right? If it's on your side. You want to do that. And then if it's the other side, if you don't like this group, so the classic example, by the way, when there's protests taking place anywhere in the world, those who are supportive of the protests, mashallah, the barakallah, the zeros get added, right? Those who are against the protests, the zeros get cut off, okay? And this is universal. And subhanAllah, it's human nature. So nobody should say, astaghfirullah, that are you accusing the historians of lying? It's human nature. It's not lying. You see a large number. So, and the Sahaba didn't have a checklist. They didn't go through the roster, one, two, three, four. When somebody's saying 20,000, yani take it you know, with understanding, okay, means it's a large number. It doesn't have to be exactly 20,000. Realistically, realistically, 20,000 seems like a, a too big of a number for that time and place. Nonetheless, it is, let us say, the largest expedition ever mounted by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's large. When it's large, what does that mean? Why will that be difficult? Resources, logistics, food, water, right? So all of this comes into play. Also, 
the uh, the Ghazwa Titabuk, it took place late July. Late July it took place. So it is the hottest time of the year where temperatures rise around 100, 115 degrees Fahrenheit in Medina. For those of you who have been there and I have lived there for 10 years, it is just surreal the amount of heat that, that is, is in the summer over there. You cannot function at all. And that's why it is the habit of the people in those regions. They don't work between Dhuhr and Asr. They just stay inside, they have a siesta, and then they work again after Asr. You cannot work in such uh, heat. So it took place in late July. Also, Ghazwa Titabuk is the furthest distance the Prophet ﷺ traveled as a uh, prophet with an army. Of course, he traveled to Jerusalem in Isra al Mi'raj, that's a separate thing. In his youth, he traveled to, uh, if, with his uncle, if the story is valid, he traveled to Syria as well. But as uh, uh, the leader of an army, this was the furthest distance he ever traveled. So he is leading an expedition far away from Medina, probably a thousand miles away, around a thousand miles away from Medina. And this is being, they're walking in the desert sun in July to go to Tabuk. Also, going to Tabuk and coming back would have taken more than a month, at least 25 days or so. And August is harvest season. August is harvest season, right after the summer is going to be the harvest season. So if they went to Tabuk, they would not be able to harvest the crops. And we need to realize one thing which is very bizarre for most of us to even imagine. Most people for most of their lives, humanity, before the era of modern jobs, did not know how much money they would make every month. We are accustomed to something called a salary. We know how much we're going to make exactly every month. Wallahi, this is a blessing from Allah, the likes of which we cannot understand. The majority of humanity for most of its existence lived day to day, week to week, month to month, just not knowing what's going to happen. And there were certain seasons that you stored up for multiple years, if you could. And the number one season was harvest season. If you owned a farm, obviously, but even if you didn't, Harvest season was the time of money. Why? Labors. People need to do things, right? So for the entire agrarian society of Medina, and it was an agrarian society, for the entire agrarian society of Medina, harvest season is basically your paycheck, not for the month, for the year. This was the, the, the biggest amount of money that would come to them would be in this harvest season. And now they're being told, sorry guys, tough luck. No, nothing. You're going to have to go, leave your, your harvest, leave everything, and then come back, you know, late August, and, and you will not get that big paycheck. This isn't the bonus paycheck. This is their hand to mouth. This is their daily bread. So this was obviously another test that they had to do. And then, of course, uh, the primary issue is that what happened in this, in this expedition was that uh, the army ran out of rations, that there was too many people, too many mouths to feed, and they ran out of even water. And it is narrated, Umar ibn Khattab uh, was asked by Ibn Abbas and others that tell us about uh, the issue of the, of the Usra, what happened in the expedition of difficulty. So he said, we left with the Prophet ﷺ in Tabuk, to Tabuk, in extremely hot weather. And we reached a place where we fell so thirsty, we thought that our throats would collapse. I mean, he used an Arabic expression, we would die. And people went out in search of water. But they came back even more tired and hungry and thirsty, nothing left. They're literally about to die. Some people sacrificed their camels in order to squeeze the water out of the sack of the camel. Now, I have never seen or done or tasted this, but I'm assuming that is a very disgusting and bitter thing. And it will probably bring you more salt than, than water. But nonetheless, they were so desperate, they killed their camels. Now, when you kill your camel, what does that mean? You have to walk the way back. The walk the entire way back, right? So they decided to kill their camels in order to squeeze whatever juice they could out of the, 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 the sack of water that the camel has. Until finally Abu Bakr pleaded with the Prophet ﷺ that Ya Rasulullah, make dua for us. Like we need a miracle basically. We need a miracle. Now can you imagine the state of affairs where they're literally, you know, they think they're going to die in this regard. To which the Prophet ﷺ said, 
if you wish and he raised his hands and uh, Umar bin Khattab said that he did not bring his hands down until the skies began to pour rain so this is another miracle and we have talked about these miracles many times this is another instance where immediately as soon as the Prophet raised his hands clouds came and Umar said that we were able to fill all of our canisters and containers with that uh, rain water now by the way this also shows us a very interesting thing the Prophet did not rely upon miracles. He sees the Sahaba at the very verge of death. But it was Abu Bakr that had to prod him. Ya Rasulullah, please, for the sake of... Why? Because, subhanAllah, this is what you call akhdu bil asbab. You, this is what you call, you have to take the means. He is Rasulullah, he's going to get miracles, of course. But he doesn't want to just rely on them. He wants to teach all of us a lesson. That you have to struggle to get to the goal. And this is the reality throughout the seerah that the Prophet had to struggle. Badr, Uhud, we see how desperate Ahzab, look at, at the very end, yes, the miracle comes. It does come, but not at the beginning. Only after struggle, only after sacrifice. And in this, inshallah, is the lesson for us as well. Maybe our miracles will not be as blatant. Maybe one of us cannot just raise our hands and then it will start raining. But wallahi, the true believers who follow the path of the Prophet ﷺ, they will see such many miracles. Maybe not to this level. Things will happen to them in their personal lives that they will see for themselves if they put in the struggle, if they put in the effort and they taste the bitterness of the struggle, then Allah Azza wa will bless them in the end. So for all of these reasons, uh, it was called uh, Jaysh al-Usra, the difficult uh, Jaysh. And the Quran references this indirectly in the Quran, uh, in a verse in the Quran that Allah Azza wa says, لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَاجِرِ وَالْأَنصَارِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ فِي سَاعَةِ الْعُسْرَةِ that Allah has accepted the repentance of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muhajir and the Ansar, those who followed him at the time of difficulty. Sa'a here would translate as at the time of difficulty. Those who followed him at the time of difficulty. This is Surah Tawbah, verse 117. Surah Tawbah, verse 117. So Allah called it Fisa'at al Usra, at the time of Usra. And that is what the name of Tabuk is. Qatada who is the main student of Ibn Abbas, he commented on this verse. This verse refers to the battle of Tabuk. Sa'at al-Usra, it refers to the battle of Tabuk. They left towards Syria in the blazing summer and they were tested severely. So much so that it is mentioned that two or more people were rationed one date per day. Two or more people were given one date as the ration per day. And they would split that date amongst themselves. However many, they would split it up. And then they would take the date pit and suck on it one after the other to get some taste and to be able to get some, I mean, maybe it's imaginary nourishment, but it made, it's better than, uh, than nothing. So Qatada said, Allah then accepted their repentance and allowed them to come back uh, home, meaning that Allah Azza wa Jal raised their ranks and, br um, and brought that home. And uh, therefore, these are the two primary names of this expedition, the expedition of Tabuk and the Jaysh al-Usra, the army of difficulty. And I explain why each one is called which. When did this take place? It took place in the month of Rajab in the ninth year of the Hijrah, six months, exactly six months after the siege of Al-Ta'if. Uh, and if you calculate this out uh, in our modern times, it's basically late July or maybe early August is when it took place. Late July or maybe early August, that would be the Rajab of the ninth year of the Hijrah. And so it, we, we understand why it would be so hot. Now, why did Ghazwat al Tabuk take place? What are the reasons for this war? What were the causes of Ghazwat al Tabuk? To be honest, this is something that I have not found a satisfactory answer after teaching Sirah many, many times and just glossing over this, I have not found a very clear-cut answer. And I have come to a conclusion that, inshallah, we'll share today. Uh, but firstly, what are some of the reasons mentioned by the classical scholars of Sirah? Some of them are outright bizarre. Some of them we can just dismiss immediately. Uh, for example, Ibn Asakir, one of the famous historians, he reports, um, and this report is mentioned by Baghwi and Ibn Kathir, he reports that the Yehud enticed the Prophet ﷺ to go up to Syria. They, they goaded him. They tried to basically trick him to go into Syria. And they said to him, if you are a true prophet, then you must go to Asham. 
because Asham is the land of the prophets and Asham is the land of Mahshar, of Judgment Day. So according to this report, the Yahud wanted to uh, get rid of the process of being in Medina and send him on some you know, goose chase of an expedition so that he abandons Medina so that they could then get rid of the uh, Muslims. And uh, according to this report, this is why Allah revealed in the Quran, Surah Isra, Verse uh, 76 They try their best and they almost have succeeded in getting rid of you from the land. They have almost succeeded in getting rid of you from the land. But if they were to succeed in getting rid of you, then they themselves would only last for a short while before Allah destroys them. So this verse in Surah Al-Isra, it is said by Ibn Asakir and others, was revealed because the Yahud tried to trick the Prophet ﷺ and send him up to north to the land of Asham. But this simply cannot be true for multiple reasons. Who can tell me some of the reasons? Number one, there's no Yahud left, that's number one. There are no more Yahud left in Medina or the surrounding areas of Medina. Number two, It's really, it, can, you, can we imagine our process and I'm just listening to something like this? Just like a, such a blatant trick, it doesn't make any sense. Number three, it's a little bit more advanced this one. Surat Isra. It's a Makki Surah. So how can I refer to Ghazwat Tabuk? It's a Makki Surah, has nothing to do with uh, Ghazwat Tabuk, okay? So, this this reason really we just dismiss it. Other reasons are given that perhaps might be more plausible. Um, one reason given is that, and this is mentioned by Al Hafid Al Haythami in his Majma' Al Zawaid and other books, that uh, the Romans were sending an expedition to battle the Muslims. That the Romans were sending an army to battle the the Muslims, and according to this narration, the chieftain of the Ghassanid uh, Arabs, the Ghassanids were. Uh, northern Arabs, the northernmost Arabian uh, tribe that bordered the Roman Empire. And over the course of uh, the last centuries, they had converted to Christianity. So the Ghassanids were one of the Christian Arab tribes. And they had a very cozy relationship with the emperor, with the Caesar. And uh, it is reported in this narration that the, the chief of the Ghassanids sent a message to the Caesar of Rome that he wants to attack Medina or according to one report that the Prophet is dead which was a false report, is a fake report and send an army so that we can attack Medina so according to this report 40,000 Roman troops were sent to uh, Tabuk or at least uh, were sent down and the Prophet went up to battle them now uh, again, I'm a little bit more critical and whatnot. Firstly, the, the narration itself, it doesn't need to be authentic in terms of it's not. Secondly, the Romans, really it is not conceivable to imagine them sending 40,000 troops to battle the Arabs because they didn't care about the Arabs. They didn't pose any threat to them. Right? They, they weren't interested in oil back then, okay? And there's no reason for the Roman Empire to send a massive legion down south. It's really nonsensical. If they wanted to conquer the Arabs, they could have done it at any time of the last three, four hundred years. So this also seems a little bit, um, uh, you know, bizarre. And it doesn't seem to be very uh, true. Uh, the th another report given is that the the... Ghassanids themselves were the target and not the Romans. The Ghassanids themselves were the targets and not the Romans. And that there was a threat that the Ghassanids would attack Medina. Now there seems to be some basis, there's some whisperings in the seerah of the validity of this. For example, uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took a month off from his wives, if you remember the story, uh, about there were some marital disputes happening and the Prophet ﷺ, uh, cut off from his wives for one month, if you remember. And he went and he lived in the masjid. Uh, we didn't talk about the story and inshallah when we finish the seerah, 
we'll just quickly go back and do the Ummahat al Mu'mineen quickly. We don't have that much narrations about them. Whatever we have, we'll do them, the mothers of the believers and whatever stories we have about them. And we'll talk about this story as well, that for one month, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he uh, cut off from his wives and he stayed in the masjid uh, because the, the, the Ummahat, uh, the, the, the mothers of the believers were demanding bigger houses and more money and whatnot. And then Allah revealed in the Quran that in kuntunna turidna al dunya wa zinataha. If you want this world and all that it has, فَتَعَالَيْنْ Come, and I will give you as much as you want, and I'll let you go, and you live your own life. But if you want Allah and His Messenger and the final and the final uh, دار al الْآخِرَةِ Then this is what I have to offer. Me- meaning, I'm not going to give you a luxurious life. Now, in that narration, in that narration, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab narrates the story that his co-worker, his colleague, his friend came running to him, rushing, and he said, Something's happened, something's happened. And Umar jumped up and he said, Has the king of the Ghassanids attacked yet? And the man said, No, something worse than this. The Prophet has divorced all his wives. Now this turned out to be a bit of exaggeration. He didn't divorce them. He, he, اعتزله, he basically separated for a, a, a month. Uh, but the point being, what did Umar say? What was he worried about? Has the king of the Ghassanids attacked yet? So this shows us there's some whiff of the Ghassanids having a threat, there being a threat. We've also seen in the past that the Ghassanids have caused issues. They have killed the messenger of the messenger. They did some, some very uh, harsh things. So perhaps this is a semi-legitimate reason. But if this is the case, the question really needs to be asked, why the month of July? If you want to take revenge at the Ghassanids, if you want to attack the Ghassanids, the Ghassanids are not going to come down in July. It's too hot for anybody to do it. So why the month of July? And this really only leads us, uh, and by the way, there's also the claim here that the Prophet wanted to get revenge for what had happened in Mu'ta and in the other uh, um, uh, massacres and up north were the tribes that did the massacres and the Ghassanids had helped those tribes so he wants to take the revenge also the death of Ja'far as well so he wants to get revenge at the death of Ja'far but once again the, the, the question that needs to be asked why now? this can wait until January why do we need to go right when the season is ripe the harvest is coming in the desert heat is at its climax why do we want to go at this point in time and really this only leaves us uh, one logical answer and that's the one that I have to come with and that is it was a command from Allah to test the believers that there doesn't seem to be an immediate threat is what I'm trying to say when you read the seerah when you read the classical books there's nothing that indicates an immediate threat neither from the Romans nor the Ghassanids so what it appears to be the case and Allah knows best we cannot go back and but whatever seems to be the case is that This was a test from Allah, a direct commandment from Allah that could not be obeyed, disobeyed. And our Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, you have to go and fight. And there is no questioning. Once he's given the command, then there is no questioning. And perhaps there is some evidence for this in the Quran. Uh, And this is the opinion, not exactly this opinion, but something similar to it, is really the opinion of Ibn Kathir and Al-Baghawi. They base this on Surah At-Tawbah. Verse 123. Surah at Tawbah, verse 123. O you who believe, do qital to those who are surrounding you. Yalunakum, those who are surrounding you of the kuffar. And let them find you to be strict in your battle, strict in your qital. Now, At-Tabari himself, and he's the earliest Mufassir that we have, At-Tabari himself says that this verse was the verse that commanded the Prophet ﷺ to fight the neighboring Arabs. And once he's done with the Arabs, to turn his attention up north to the Romans. So this is Surat At-Tawbah. And Surat At-Tawbah was revealed pretty much all of it in Ghazwa Tabuk. So perhaps it is as if this verse came down and our Prophet ﷺ understood, and of course he understands what is intended by Allah. Our Prophet ﷺ understood, Allah has commanded me to go up north now that I have conquered all of the central Arabs and really the rest of the Arabs are going to follow. There's no major threat left from within the Arabian Peninsula other than the Ghassanids way up north and the Ghassanids are a threat not because of the Ghassanids but because of their connection with the Romans with the connection with the Romans. So it is as if 
Allah commanded our Prophet ﷺ to go and fight those who are neighboring them. Those who are neighboring, one after the other, go and fight. And so our Prophet ﷺ understood this to be uh, the, uh, the Romans. And uh, what would add to this interpretation is that Al-Waqidi, the, uh, the famous authority of the Seerah, he mentions that the Prophet ﷺ sent out uh, messengers to the neighboring tribes, even to Mecca, requesting them to send all able-bodied men to fight with him. And that he did not hide where he was going. Unlike every other battle, he hid it. He didn't tell them what's happening. But the battle of Tabuk, he was open. Everybody knew what's going on. So this is not a surprise attack. This is an all-out, if you like, military expedition. Everybody knows where the process is going. And he's calling people from around, even the new converts from Mecca. And all of the surrounding tribes, he's bringing them forth. And what really, in my opinion, seals the, 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 the interpretation to be this one, is that if you read Surah At-Tawbah, cover to cover, and Surah At-Tawbah is one of the longest surahs in the Quran, by the way, even though it is the ninth surah, it's actually one of the longest surahs in the Quran. If you read Surah At-Tawbah cover to cover, never is the command for qital and jihad given so bluntly as it is in Surah At-Tawbah. And Surah At-Tawbah is all about Ghazwati Tabuk. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is commanding in a manner that you will not find anywhere in the Quran. And that's why Surah At-Tawbah is also called Surah Al-Qital. It's also one of the names of Surah At-Tawbah is Surah Al-Qital. Because it is all about Qital, Qital, Qital. And look at um, what Allah Azza wa Jal says. For example, in uh, Surah At-Tawbah, يَا أَيُّوَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَا لَكُمْ إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ أُنْفِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ ثَاقَلْتُ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ أَرَضِيتُمْ بِالْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْآخِرَةِ فَمَا مَتَعُوا الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا قَلِيلٍ Or oh, you who believe, what is the problem? Why? What is the problem? مَا لَكُمْ When it is said to you, infiru, go ahead, forth in, exped in expeditions. And infiru is the term that the process is using, that I need you to go out. What is the matter with you? When you are told to go forth, your bodies feel heavily attracted to the ground. Right? Are you more content with this dunya than the next? And so what is the uh, comparison of this world with the next except for a small bit? If you don't go forth, Allah will punish you a severe punishment. And Allah will bring another ummah besides you, another qawm besides you, and they will not be like you. That's very strict. You have to go. Why aren't you going? If you don't go, Allah will punish you. If you don't go, you're going to be gotten rid of. Another ummah will come after you. And also uh, in the same surah, infiru khifafan wa thiqala. Go forth, whether you have something, whether you have lots, or whether you have nothing. Khifafan wa thiqala means whether you're heavily armed, whether you're not armed at all. Go forth, whatever state you're in. Khifafan wa thiqala. And also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that. About the munafiqoon, لَوْ كَانَ عَرَضًا قَرِيبًا وَسَفَرًا قَاصِدًا لَتَّبَعُوكَ وَلَكِنْ بَعُدَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الشُّقَّةِ That if there was lots of money and the distance was short, the hypocrites would have come with you. But they couldn't stand the strenuous journey. It was too much for them. And they will swear to you that if we were able to participate, we would have participated. يُهْلِكُونَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ Allah is testifying that they are liars and by these lies they are destroying themselves. Now, if you look at all of these verses, and by the way, these verses are always used by the jihadist groups, right? And there's nothing wrong with using verses by anybody at any time. The problem comes, these groups, they cut and paste these verses as if they apply only to their particular cause. And this is a big problem. The only time a verse can apply to a specific cause is for the cause it came down. In any other time, you have to use it with the disclaimer. Might apply, might not apply. Right? You see my point here. That Allah revealed this surah when? For which expedition? For Tabuk. Nobody can now take a verse and then apply it to a particular expedition and say, if you don't go on this expedition, Allah will punish you. You understand what I'm saying? Right? That type of specificity can only be done for when the verses came down. 
All of these verses are valid. And wallahi, there will be many expeditions in the past and in the future where these verses will have some legitimacy. But you are not allowed to, and this is one of the things that these groups do, you are not allowed to cut Quran and Hadith, then apply it only for your situation, such that it was revealed just for you. No, it was revealed for Battle of Tabuk. And the bluntness of encouraging people to go for Qital in Tabuk, you will not find it for any other battle. And I, want, I don't have time in these lectures to read all of Surah uh, Tawbah for you, but please, one of the things of the seerah in that I'm doing, I reconnect you with the Quran. And I want you to read Surah Tawbah now, when you get a chance with this in mind, with the incidents of Tabuk in mind, you will find the strictness and the bluntness of going for Qital, of encouraging Jihad, you will not find it in any other Surah. So in my humble opinion, and Allah knows best, it seems to me that the primary reason for Ghazwa to Tabuk was not because of something physical in the world, not because of armies or expeditions or, or Ghassan or the Romans, it was because Allah told them to. And the Sahaba were put to a test. And Allah Azza wa wanted to test them. Now why did Allah want to test them? Well, for many reasons. One of them to raise their ranks, one of them to test their Iman, and one of them to prepare them for the future ghazawat that would expand Islam after the death of the Prophet Because this was the final ghazwa. This is it, khalas. There is no ghazwa after the ghazwa titabuk that the Prophet participated in. Right after this, the Prophet went to for Hajj, he fell ill, and then we're going to come to the end of the seerah. Then what happened? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, the Umayyads, they're beginning. So it is as if Ghazwa Tabuk was a test so that they pass it, so that they then move on to make the Ummah what it was. Allahu Alam, this is my two cents, take it or leave it. But this is what I see to be the case. If you look at the context and the story, there's no threat. It is a commandment from Allah merely to test the Sahaba. And that is why no battle took place. There's no need for a battle. They passed the test. They showed that they had the determination. In fact, the battle is easier than what they had to undergo, right? To give up all that they had to uh, do. And so uh, we, with all of this, as we said, it seems as if uh, the Prophet ﷺ was commanded by Allah and the Sahaba were put to the uh, test and therefore uh, the Sahaba passed this test with flying, uh, with flying colors and that is why the Prophet ﷺ did not hide where he's going that is why he made it public that is why he called out for all of the Sahaba to come so it was fard ayn for every single healthy male to participate in Ghazwa Tabuk Fard Ayn. This is not like Badr, which was voluntary. This was not like other battles. This was Fard Ayn. You had to do it if you were an adult male. The only person who was, who was excused was somebody who was genuinely sick or had very extenuating circumstances. We're going to come to this point, right? So what other battle was it that every able-bodied Muslim from around Medina, even from Mecca, you have to come and you have to participate? It is to me clear and Allah knows best that this was a test for all of the Sahaba so that when they pass this test, inshaAllah ta'ala, they can then in the future, after the process will move on, they have now the Iman, the faith, the courage, they have now what they need to go on and, and basically expand the Islamic Ummah. Um, <sighs> SubhanAllah, so much left here. Uh, just one quick point inshaAllah ta'ala, then we'll open the floor for questions. Also, there's some announcements that need to be made as well. Uh, that. Therefore, when the Prophet understood the need for uh, having this expedition, the first thing that he did, he began to collect the funds. He began to collect the funds for the expedition, and he would uh, stand on the mimbar and encourage people to give whatever they had. So Sahaba would come, and somebody would have a bag of gold, somebody would have some coins, somebody would have whatever it was, until the piles began to form in the masjid. And our Prophet gave very beautiful encouragements. Whoever finances the Jaysh al-Usra, he shall be given Jannah. If you help in financing Jaysh al-Usra, you will be given Jannah. Whatever you can help out with. That's a beautiful blessing and praise. Whoever finances Jaysh al-Usra will be given Jannah. And so the Sahaba began to donate whatever they could. And of course, we all know the famous story, the lion's share of the donation went to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu that it had just so happened that around a hundred camels of his had returned 
from uh, an expedition up north. And so he had just got back all of these goods. And when he heard this hadith that uh, whoever finances Jaysh al-Usra, he shall be given Jannah. So Uthman ibn Affan donated all of that money. And this was in the thousands of gold coins. He donated all of that money and he gave it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had all of this pile of gold just from Uthman in front of him. And he began flipping all of this coin around in his hands. And he said, Wallahi ma darra Uthman ma fa'ala ba'd al That Wallahi whatever Uthman does after today, it is not going to harm him after what he has done now. Whatever he has done after today, it will not harm him. And SubhanAllah, this hadith which is in Bukhari and Muslim, him, Uthman ibn Affan himself used it when these neo kharijites were around his own house and they had surrounded him and he did not know they were going to kill him but this was one of the things that do you not know and Ibn Abbas as well used it to defend Uthman Ibn Affan that do you not know our Prophet said whatever your complaints are Whatever your, your fabricated complaints are, your imaginary complaints are, don't you know your own Rasul said that whatever Uthman does will not harm him. If he, the Prophet said that, who are you to have these long list of complaints that you don't like his governor, you don't like this, you don't like that. Who are you to complain when the Prophet said whatever he does will not be uh, harmful to him. So this hadith was given at the uh, incident of uh, Tabuk. And also over here, uh, the famous story of Abu Bakr and Umar's competition as well took place that Umar immediately went home thinking that today finally I can beat Abu Bakr because I heard this hadith directly from the Prophet ﷺ, whoever finances Jaysh al-Usra shall be given Jannah and so uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab took half of his wealth and he gave it to the Prophet ﷺ. and I realize again this is half of his wealth the rest of the half is for his wife and children so obviously it's nothing wrong with this I mean subhanAllah you're not even required to give half of your wealth this is the Prophet ﷺ did not say you have to give everything he said you have to come what was far was to go physically with him as for money whatever could a person can afford and imagine giving half of your wealth not knowing when the next is going to come remember there's no paychecks here and you have to give up your, your paycheck for the, the, the season. So Umar ibn al-Khattab gave up half of his entire uh, wealth that he possessed. And when Abu Bakr came with what he had, and it was more, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Abu Bakr, what did you leave for your family? What did you leave? You don't, it looks like you bought everything. And Abu Bakr said, I left them Allah and his messenger. I left them Allah and his messenger. That's enough, Allah will take care of them. right? So Umar ibn al-Khattab said that I give up. I'm not going to compete with you again after today. No way I can compete with that type of tawakkul. So uh, this was also in the Ghazwati Tabuk, that famous instance as well. And our Prophet ﷺ gathered uh, more money for the expedition than he had for any other expedition. Now subhanAllah, it's a beautiful point here that six months previously, he had at his disposal all the money he needed. Six months previously, he has just had the ghanima of Hunayn and Ta'if. Right? But he used it all fi sabilillah. And nothing was left in his own pocket or in the pocket of the treasury. Nothing. And therefore, when, and that was his methodology, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not have, leave anything in his, he, everything fi sabilillah. Everything. So this had to be refinanced for the Ghazwat e Tabuk. And uh, eventually the funds ran out and begin to dwindle down. And inshallah, we'll just finish on one final uh, narration, inshallah, and then open the floor for some questions. Uh, that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari narrates that his tribe sent him to collect some camels to go for the Ghazwati Tabuk. Why? Because you need camels to go. You cannot just walk to Tabuk. You need camels and you share. I, either every three, every two people will share a camel. So uh, Abu Musa's sub-tribe sends him as an emissary and, and says, okay, we have this many people, we need camels. So Abu Musa says, I arrived and I did not realize that the Prophet was fi halati ghadban, he was in an angry state. I did not know this. Now, why was he angry? This narration does not say, most likely it was because of what's happening with the munafiqun, which we'll talk about inshallah uh, tomorrow or, or it's not tomorrow, next week or the week after that. There was a major issue with the munafiqun. Most likely this is what is troubling our Prophet So I came and I didn't realize the Prophet was in a state of anger. So I asked him and he didn't have anything. And he said, Wallahi, I will not give you anything to travel upon. Like that's a, a slightly harsh way to say it. Abu Musa wants to come. 
He wants to go. And the Prophet said, Wallahi, I'm not going to give you anything to travel upon. So Abu Musa says, I returned distressed. Did not realize, I didn't know he was angry from something else. And I thought I might have done something wrong. He is angry with me. He is irritated at me. I went back and I told my, my tribe that uh, our Prophet said such and such that he's not going to give us anything. And I do not know why. And then barely had any time passed when Bilal came and Bilal said to me, the Prophet is calling you. So Abu Musa came and the Prophet said, take these two camels. And then these two, and then these two, and he's giving them six camels. Total of six camels, I have just purchased them from Sa'ad. So uh, what had happened obviously was that some money had come, and so he purchases six camels. He remembers Abu Musa uh, needed the camels, he gives them to him. So the process is registering who is coming uh, and, and what they want, and he then fulfills this. What this also shows is that when you give an oath and you don't mean it, the oath is not considered valid because he said wallahi i'm not going to give you anything why did he say this because he didn't have anything he did not have anything so there's nothing to give him and we use the phrase wallahi as an expression and sometimes we use it as a genuine qasim and it is obvious from the context one is the two so for example uh you want to go and eat over here oh, wallahi i don't want to go there akhi. You don't mean like you're swearing by Allah, you're never going to go there. It's just an expression, you know. Well, I really don't feel like going over there right now. Whereas in a serious state and somebody has accused you of, let's say, you're lying or something. Wallahi, I am not lying to you. Now when you say it, you mean it. And there is a clear context. And Allah says in the Quran, لا يؤاخذكم الله باللغو في أيمانكم Allah does not call you to task for the lagu, for the vain times that you give the ayman. Ayman means say wallahi. But rather Allah will call you to task for that which you are strict and firm about. And our Prophet ﷺ is a human being and things are happening that sometimes perturb him, make him angry. The Arabic word used is ghadban. And sometimes he will take it out in a manner that uh, Abu Musa did not understand. But it wasn't because of Abu Musa's fault. And therefore, when the money came and he's able to purchase it, he gave it to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. But Abu Musa uh, wanted to confirm because the Prophet had sworn, Wallahi, you're not going to give it to me. And now he is giving him the camels, so he was a bit confused now. So he brought, he took his tribesmen and he wanted to clarify that you use the qasam and now you're giving me the camels and there's the issue or whatnot. So it was explained to him that no, it's all right. You can take the camels. And this shows us the consciousness of uh, the conscience of Abu Musa and the Sahaba. They felt awkward like taking the camel now that the qasam has been given and the Prophet said, I'm not going to give you anything. Then he gave him. And so he had to be explained what happened here. And that is that the Prophet did not have any money. And so he said, I have nothing to give you. And he came out in a way that sounded a little bit different than it, than, uh, it should have. And so when the money came, the, uh, the camels were purchased and given over to Abu Ayyub, al, uh, sorry, to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And inshallah with that, uh, we will pause for today and continue inshallah ta'ala next, uh, next Wednesday.